Good afternoon, and welcome to this virtual program with Dr. Lindsay Harris. I'm Frank Goodyear, and I have the pleasure of co-directing the Bowdoin College Museum of Art with my wife, Anne Collins Goodyear. This program is being organized in conjunction with the exhibition In Light of Rome, Early Photography from the Capital of the Art World, 1842 to 1871, which remains on view at the museum until June 4th. We are thrilled to welcome back to campus, at least virtually, Lindsay Harris, a member of the Bowdoin class of 2000. Appropriately for this program, Lindsay is in Rome, uh, where she currently serves as the interim Andrew Haskell Art Director at the American Academy in Rome. Prior to that appointment, she was the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of the Humanities at the Academy. In addition to directing the Academy's exhibitions and programs, Lindsay is a scholar of photographic history, specializes, specializing in early 20th century Italian photography. Her forthcoming book is entitled An Eye for Progress, Primitivism and the Modern Italian Landscape, 1910 to 1955, which Rutledge is publishing next year. Lindsay's work at the Academy, which began in 2014 as a Rome Prize Fellow in Modern Italian Studies, is starting to wind down uh, as she has recently been appointed a position at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C. There she will serve as the head of that museum's Research and Scholars Center. In any case, we are deeply appreciative that she can join us this afternoon. Before I turn the stage over to Lindsay, though, a few program details. After her talk, we will return for a live question and answer session. If you have a question, please don't hesitate to pose it using the Q&A function. Also, for those who wish to use closed captioning, that function exists for today's programming. That said, without further delay, please welcome Lindsay Harris. Lindsay? Frank, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It's such a pleasure, even virtually, to be back as part of the Bowdoin uh, community. Um, it's a place that I miss very dearly while I've been here in Rome. Uh, I'd like first to begin with some expressions of gratitude to Frank and to Anne for the invitation to participate in the programming around this wonderful exhibition uh, in light of Rome, and also to thank uh, John McGuigan and Mary McGuigan for the wonderful collection that they have so generously shared with the Bowdoin community and the public in Maine and in Rome and worldwide through programs like this. Um, it's really a spectacular uh, exhibition from what I've seen from the catalog, which is also a marvelous publication, extremely rich in its pub, um, reproductions. And uh, what I wanted to do today was to think a little bit, using this uh, exhibition as a springboard, to think deeply about some of the uh, photographs that are included in the exhibition have made me think more deeply about the nature of the, phot the photograph and what it represents, what kinds of questions we ask of photographs. Um, most people think of Rome and they think of antiquity. And in fact, one of the things that emerges from this catalog and exhibition is that certainly the focus of many of the photographers, this international range of photographers who are drawn to Rome are drawn to represent its ancient monuments. To be sure, this is one of the primary objectives is to document that ancient history. Um, but I think what's more fascinating for me uh, as somebody who studies modern history is to think about this moment that the exhibition represents in which Rome itself is in a huge state of transition uh, becoming, a, it is a papal city. This is around, you know, with the emergence of phot photography in 1839. Uh, it is, Rome is still a papal city, but there is great turmoil burgeoning up for Rome to be capital of a modern Italian nation and become a European capital city. Uh, this is going to be a huge shift politically, culturally, socially, and as we can see through these photographs, it's going to have an enormous impact on the physical surroundings of the city. So here you have a city undergoing massive change, but you also have a moment where even in the, let's say, 15 years or two decades that this uh, exhibition really focuses on, you have a tremendous transformation within the, uh, the medium of photography itself. This is a show that I think beautifully underscores how heterogeneous, what does photograph connote? What does that word mean in this period? And it really signifies a whole host of different kinds of images. Um, and then I think the other thing that this exhibition 
uh, offers is an opportunity for us to really think deeply about the questions that we ask of photographs. Um, there have been moments in the history of photography as people talk about this medium. Are we looking at the photograph as a document of truth? Are we looking at, at historical evidence? Are we looking at an artistic represent, representation of a subject? Um, what are we not seeing in a photograph? This is a question perhaps more often asked of photography than asked of painting, um, because there's this assumption that it's just a, a window onto a scene and this is the truth. But of course, a photographer has chosen to exclude certain things. Why are they excluding certain things and what are those things? Um, and then of course, that can lead to whole other questions that are more, let's say, pertinent to the kinds of issues that are driving contemporary conversations about contemporary culture. So um, Frank addresses those types of shifting inquiries really nicely, I thought, in his catalog essay, where he points out that one of the things that's so exciting about this selection of photographs is that it sparks conversation as much about what is represented as also as what is not. Um, so I think one of my aims today is to rethink Rome, not as a city of antiquity, but rather to think of it as a real seat of modernity. And by modernity, I mean a seat of change. If one thinks about what does the word modern mean, at its essence, it's a word that means new. It doesn't mean in the now, that's what contemporary means, but mo modernity is really about change. And we're looking at a moment of change in the mid 19th century, century where change has really just sped up tremendously. That's what's so unsettling in some ways about the post-industrial nature of modernity. Uh, and of course, then you have the opportunity to represent these changes through photography and photography, I argue in my work, uh, one of the things I want to make the case today is actually driving that change. It's not just documenting that change. It's having an impact on what happens uh, in an urban context. Um, so I'll be looking today, as I, my title hints at, but things evolve as between when one thinks of titles and one actually uh, puts together the content of one's thoughts. Photojournalism is a key term that I'll throw out there, but what I mean by that really are thinking about photographs as in the way that Molly Nesbitt describes them, photographs with a job to do. I'm interested in photographs in terms of the impact that they can have on people's ideas about the subject that they represent um, and how those ideas then lead to action or inaction, depending on the nature of what the photographs are representing. So with that, I want to start with uh, this image here. The way that I'll go about this, I'll be, read a section now of a paper that puts together my thoughts, uh, focusing very deeply on a set of images. And then I'll resume to speaking more extemporaneously about the final series of images that I'll be sharing today. So one of the earliest pictures uh, in the exhibition that we're here to celebrate today shows an area of Rome as it appears in the 1840s, which is just a few years after the pioneering French photographer Louis Daguerre introduced the world's first practical camera in 1839. Since the photographic equipment of that day required longer exposure times, architecture was a frequent subject for forays with the medium. The documentary or journalistic function of this imagery, which I consider to mean its capacity to ch affect change over time, is often an unintended byproduct of this imagery. These are pictures that were also taken when the rise of nationalism was redefining the makeup of the modern world. And early photographs often provide rare documentation of cities or buildings in this particular case uh, that are in the throes of transformation due to war, physical modernization of housing or infrastructure, and campaigns to fashion national capitals, is, which is the case. All of those things are happening uh, at the time of this exhibition's uh, representation of Rome. In these images, we see at once a city in transformation, uh, as well as a medium of representation evolving uh, into the types of photographic images we know today. Uh, and we also see, I think, the opportunity to push the questions we ask of images uh, into different directions to understand history from new perspectives, which of course then offers the opportunity for us to rethink how we ourselves uh, are, see and are uh, portrayed within uh, the world in which we operate today. So in the 1840s, photographers were just beginning to understand the potential of their new medium to serve national interests. Italians were just struggling, beginning their struggle to forge, forge a unified nation, which is a process in Italian referred to as the Risorgimento, 
This term suggests the resurgence of Italy's glorious past in ancient Rome and in the Renaissance, yet it also conjures a desire to define the new nation uh, on the promise of the future an Italy that would be now hopefully liberated from a host of foreign rulers. This included the Austrians who occupied portions of the north of the peninsula, the Spanish Bourbons dominating the south, including the island of Sicily, and the papal states that controlled all of central Italy, including most importantly for this case, Rome, which was the ideological linchpin of Italian nationalism. Giuseppe Mazzini, a chief architect of Italian nationalism, spoke of establishing, quote, the third Rome, a term that conveys the politician's aspiration to ensure for the eternal city a modern status equivalent to the Rome of the Caesars or the Rome of the Popes, that being the first and the second Rome. Seizing the city from the church uh, to establish Rome as a new Italian capital was not easy. And Mazzini and Giuseppe Garibaldi, the celebrated military commander, discovered this very quickly in the summer of 1849 as I will shortly describe, yet it was essential if Italy wanted to be, uh, begin to make visible what Don Doyle has termed, quote, the nationalism of an imagined Italian community, uh, that the, the forays, the sort of um, military campaigns of 1849 uh, get underway. What I'm showing you here is um, a reproduction of a, an image that appears as a figure in the exhibition catalog. It's not actually part of the exhibition, but I wanted to um, start with this photograph taken in 1849 because it is part of a series that constitutes one of the first photographs of war. Uh, so we might think of this particular image as part of a suite of some 40 calotypes um, which are salt, salt paper prints, which is a type of image that features very prominently in this exhibition, taken by Italian photographer Stefano Lecchi in the immediate aftermath of the Siege of Rome in the summer of 1849. So this is one of the major first um, important battles of the Risorgimento. Originally from Lombardy, uh, Lecchi was active in France in the mid 1840s, where he experimented with early forms of photography, including daguerreotypes. He also contributed to the development of the calotype process, which is where uh, the process in which he eventually excelled. By 1846, Lecky returned to Italy where he carried out one of the first photographic campaigns in Pompeii and became part of the Roman school of calotypists, which included Giacomo Caneva and Frédéric Flacheron, who was a French uh, pensionnaire in, the architect in architecture at Villa Medici. And these are two photographers who also feature in this exhibition. Some 40 of the calotypes that Lecky took of the siege of Rome came to be known not as the photographs that we see, but through lithographs, uh, which were published almost immediately after this battle in 1849 through copy prints. Um, they were also known through copy prints, a selection of which um, were soon in the Museo del Risorgimento in Rome. In 1997, photography historian Marina Miraglia, by accident, unearthed a vintage set of Lecchi's calotypes in the collection of Rome's Biblioteca di Storia Moderna in Contemporanea. So this is a library dedicated to modern and contemporary history. Um, that particular series of prints had originally belonged to Andrea Calandrelli, who was a Republican who had fought in the Roman siege and replaced Mazzini as triumvir in Italy in July of 1849. So that was his personal photo photographic collection that had ended up in this library and nobody knew it was there until 1997. And in 2011, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Italian unification, they digitized the entire collection. I'll have two forthcoming images uh, from that project. The calotypes themselves, however, have been recognized as a crown jewel of this library's collection and have been placed in a vault. There's a second vintage set of the, these Lecky prints in the collection of the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles, one of the scans of which you see here. This selection is um, of prints is available to researchers. Isotta Poggi is a scholar at the Getty who has worked very closely on this particular set, uh, but they too are not on view and the museum really encourages people to look at the digital reproductions as the photographs themselves are very fragile and light sensitive. Um, I mention all of this to talk a little bit about the physicality, the practicality of how photographs survive and what constitutes a photograph. Of course, the majority of people would have encountered these images as reproductions, lith as lithographs in um, print media, um, journals, newspapers, this kind of thing. So uh, through, through this talk, I think this exhibition is one of the wonderful ways to really think about what do we mean when we say the word photograph. Um, so within a decade of 
um, photography's development, the photographic archive of which I've just uh, spoken, became a potent means to represent common national identity to newly uni uh, united citizens in Italy. These archives indicate also that the mid in the mid-19th century, political leaders in Italy espoused a notion of nationalism that included freedom from foreign rule, as this war suggests the whole point of this battle was to push the French forces out of the Vatican and have Roman nationalists take over Rome. They're unsuccessful, they lose this battle, but that's the aim. Um, and these photographs also show uh, that an idea of Italy as a nation was bound around uh, the idea of bringing together a heterogeneous population to co coalesce around a set of shared beliefs, uh, including a commitment to the humanitarian ideal of liberty for all citizens, even if those universal rights were far from a reality. Um, so I think we also, these photographs are an opportunity to think about really who do we mean by Roman, who had access to this kind of imagery and even these kinds of discussions. So with these calotypes, Lecky broadcast across Europe the struggle for national independence and unification that characterized the making of modern Italy. In June of that year, 1849, Pope Pius IX ordered the French military to attempt to topple the Roman Republic, uh, a short-lived constitutional government that had been instated by Mazzini and his colleagues six months earlier. By late July, the siege of Rome in the city's western outskirts left over 3,000 men dead, hundreds more wounded, and a handful of Renaissance and Baroque villas, rustic houses, and a Roman wall smoldering in heaps on, of rubble on the Janiculum Hill. And I should say this, this all of these um, pockmarked war-torn buildings are right in the neighborhood of the American Academy in Rome from which I'm speaking, and all of the streets around this neighborhood today are named after um, the military heroes, let's say, of that battle. Within a matter of days, Stefano Lecchi was on hand to survey the damage. So this is a key point here. We're at a moment of photojournalism where the photographer is not there in battle. The battle happens, and then he's called to document the aftermath. Um, these, as I said, are acknowledged as the first instance of war photography, a point that John makes in the catalog, uh, which was a status once attributed to Roger Fenton's photographs of the Crimean War. However, Lecky's pictures precede those uh, and are also among the earliest photographic illustrations of modern uh, nationalist ideals. Their focus on Rome's newest monuments, so not the monuments of antiquity, but instead um, Renaissance villas that have now are becoming monuments and symbols of this war and this fight for national uh, unity. Um, the imme immediate dissemination of these images through lithographs and wood engravings make evident the determination of early Italian nationalists to establish a new constitutional government at whatever cost. At the same time, the images reveal the limitations of popular uprisings in the struggle for Italian unification, as well as the potency of Italy's history to serve as both a crucible and a catalyst in the course of modernity. Possibly as early as the end of July 1849, with battle wounds on the landscape still fresh, Lecky set out to document the destruction on Rome's Janiculum Hill. Previously, this pinnacle above the right bank of the Tiber had been best known for its great fountain, um, which was built in 1612 to mark the end of the Aqua Paola, the aqueduct um, named after Pope Paul V and restored, who restored the conduit and named it after himself. Further up the hill, the Porta di San Pancrazio marked the southwestern entrance to the city where aristocratic villas built in the 16th and 17th centuries dot dotted the hillside like the Villa Corsini, which you see on your screens now in ruins. Little trace remains in Lecky's photographs of the idyllic atmosphere that had characterized the geniculum only weeks earlier. The Villa Corsini, which you see here, also known as the Casino dei Quattro Venti, shown from a worm's eye view at the base of a hill, looms over an expanse of ragged brush and parched earth in the foreground. The building's facade presented parallel to the picture plane has been all but obliterated by, quote, the war of bombs and cannons, end quote, that Mazzini described in his account of the attack in Rome that summer. In the center of the image, uh, beneath the blown out windows and pockmarked walls, I don't know if you can see just there in the arch, a man rests against a pile of rubble, his silhouette framed against the gaping hole that was once the building's entrance. As Maria Pia Critelli has observed, fig figures like this one recur throughout Lecky's Janiculum series. It was customary in early photographs to pose figures in architectural or landscape views to provide a sense of scale. However, the figures in Lecky's images have a more significant and symbolic function. 
Starting in February of 1849, when Garibaldi and his army of volunteers established the Roman Republic, young men had secured the city's new status and fought to preserve it. The young men in Lecky's pictures are not shown in the throes of action. The, the medium of photography didn't permit that kind of re uh, representation at the time. Uh, instead, they are depicted in moments of reflection. They're seated at the base of a villa in ruins, as in the case of this uh, villa here, or standing amidst a war-ravaged landscape. They then mark the beginning of a next phase of his history, in which experience gives way to a commemoration of recent tragic events. So even in an image like this one, we see change underway. We see a shift from the moment of battle, the moment of action, to already days later, commemoration has begun. The process of creating new monuments uh, has started. In this regard, Lecky's uh, Lecky's figures illustrate what landscape theorist John B. Jackson describes as, quote, the necessity for ruins. Ruins, observes Jackson, provide the incentive for restoration and for a return to origins, end quote. In Lecky's views, we see the onset of a physical process of restoration that would, over the next century and a half, develop into a residential neighborhood embedded with historical memory of the failed battle to preserve the Roman Republic. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a whole host of streets here named for Via Garibaldi. There's an enormous statue of Garibaldi nearby here. It's the opening scene of um, Paolo Sorrentino's La Grande Bellezza, for those of you who have seen it. Um, this whole area, the whole hill has become a monument in some ways uh, to this particular battle. Uh, to nurture nationalist sentiment, photographs like monuments have to be seen. Monuments are often large scale structures situated in the public realm and are highly visible. Photographs, in contrast, are relatively small objects that are frequently kept in albums or displayed in domestic settings, where they are viewed regularly, but only by a handful of people. Already by the 1840s, however, photographs, including daguerreotypes, uh, of which there are several examples in this exhibition that are spectacular, circulated widely among the public in Italy through reproductions in print media. The publication of lithographs, wood engravings, and other types of prints in illustrated books, newspapers, and broadsides contributed to what Benedict Anderson has referred to as, quote, print capitalism, end quote, which allowed modern nations to generate an abstract concept of a common identity among citizens who had never met each other. Lecky's documentation of the Siege of Rome achieved far greater success as lithographs or wood engravings than it did as a photographic series. Before 1997, his views were known exclusively through other artists' prints, none of which acknowledged the photographs from which they had been uh, taken or from which they had derived. As Marina Miraglia has demonstrated, Lecky's photographs became the basis for popular prints by artists on both sides of the conflict. So both the pro-papacy and pro-Italian uh, unification almost as immediately after they were taken, which also speaks, I think, to the malleability of the subjectivity of photography an image can be used in the hands of virtually, you know, a whole people with a range of perspectives, depending on the text that you associate with the photograph, uh, in the way that Mary Price has suggested that photographs take on meaning when associated with words. Perhaps the most spectacular appropriation of Lecky's imagery appears in the Italian-based American author Jesse White Mario's illustrated biography of Garibaldi, which was published in 1884, and I'm showing a copy of that here. As Isotta Poggi has shown, Ma White Mario's uh, accompanied her text with a series of wood engravings by an artist called Eduardo Mattania, all, almost all of which are based upon Sec Lecky's Siege of Rome photographs. Uh, as had been true of earlier lithographic reproduction of Lecky's pictures, uh, Mattania's engravings embellish the photographs with invented details to heighten the drama of the siege. In his depiction of the Casino dei Quattroventi, for example, he presents the ruined villa as a ghostly backdrop for tangles of bayonets and fallen soldiers, plumes of smoke uh, in the background. Quote, once the enemy has taken this site, which Garibaldi had understood to be the strategic key to defense, the fall of Rome was close, end quote, uh, wrote Mario of this battle on June 3rd in 1849. Matania's hyperbolic rendition of Lecky's photograph makes plain the tragic events that claim the lives of the Republican heroes Francesco D'Averio, Angelo Mazzina, Enrico Dandolo, these are all street names around here, uh, and Goffredo Mamelli, who is the author of the Italian national anthem. I should also note that these men were all at oldest 24 when they, when they died. In Light of Rome features a handful of photographs uh, on a second subject of great interest to photographers in Rome. Um, 
in addition, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a page. Matanya's compulsion, uh, yeah, let's see, sorry. Yes, the other thing I wanted to suggest is that, yes, um, there are a handful of the photographs in the exhibition. I've now taken a deep dive into Leckie's series. Uh, I now wanna zoom out to think in a similarly deep way about two other subjects represented um, in recurring photographs in the exhibition, which are just a handful of the many photographs of these particular subjects, uh, of which are, those are, uh, both of which are along the Tiber embankments. One of them is the Porto di Ripetta, um, for those of you who have been to Rome, it's the site just before the Arapaches Museum, where Richard Meyer created his new museum. Um, and the other is Palazzo Altoviti, which none of us would have seen because it was uh, demolished after by the 1880s. Um, certainly both of the sites that I will show you, none of us will have ever seen in person. They were both destroyed by the time Italy celebrated 50 years of unification in 1910. Um, and I'm just going to speak through these um, because I find them fascinating to discuss in this particular kind of way. So I'm showing here an exhibition uh, photograph, one by Giacomo Caneva, which shows the, port, the Porto di Ripetta. Um, and so again, for those of you who are familiar with Rome, on the right hand side, the building that curves to the background is the Palazzo Borghese and leads then behind all of that is um, the Camp, Campo Marzio, the Campus Martius. And then to the left of the site that you see here is where the Arapaches Museum is today. Of course, at this particular time, that Arapaches Monument was not there because it was still underground. It had not yet been excavated and it was only placed there in the 1930s. So already, I think even in my description of what this scene shows, um, you're getting a sense of how rapidly Rome was massively trans transforming. Uh, and a site like this one is really one of the most chaotic and intense sites of re redesign, um, which led people to get very up in arms about uh, historic preservation. So the, what we're seeing here is the actual port. This was a functioning port along the banks of the Tiber. So the ships, the little boats that you see in the foreground would come into the steps. They would lo be loaded with their cargo, their goods that they would be bringing um, from the coast uh, of the Mediterranean down through Ostia along the Tiber into Rome. And then if you can see here in the image on the right-hand side, there's a shorter structure with small little columns. That's the customs house, the Dogana, which is attached to the Palazzo Borghese that's still there today. Uh, and so people would bring the, the fishermen or the, the captains would bring the boats up to the, anchor them there at the edge of the river and walk up these steps. Now, for those of you looking at these steps might think, hmm, I've seen stairs that look a lot like these before. And you would be right. Um, if you think of the Piazza di Spagna, the Spanish steps designed by Alessandro Specchi in the 17th century, this is the same architect, um, a contemporary of Bernini uh, and thinking about the great architects of Baroque Rome uh, who designed that staircase. And in fact, it was modeled after this particular staircase at the Porto di Ripetta. So this was an area that was redesigned to look as you see it here in this photograph by Caneva, uh, which was taken around 1850. So for about 200 years, the port of Ripetta looked like this. And it had this grand monumental in terms of its stature and um, you know, curved dynamism there in the middle of the city was really a throbbing commercial and cultural hub of Rome. Um, we see this particular site from a different angle in a second photograph in the exhibition uh, by Cop Martin, a French photographer, who is representing the same site in this particular image, one of the few hor uh, vertical images in the exhibition. You'll have to imagine that that staircase that we just saw is to the immediately to the left of this particular photograph. So we've shifted about 90 degrees and the photographer is probably inside a building taking this photograph from a window to get this somewhat aerial view of the top of the staircase. Uh, and what's a little bit confusing is that you're not able to see the stairs and the boats are right up there on the top of the 
stairs because there's a flood, as the title suggests. This is a photograph taken in 1861 when there's a massive flood uh, in the Tiber River, and it floods even via de la Scrofa, which is the road that extends from the foreground into the background, and the area is very blurry, and that's because the water is moving. Uh, and so the whole place is inundated with the Tiber River, which has flooded its embankments, which was the great problem of modern Rome. The Tiber, for those of you who have been to Rome, is a very swoopy river. It makes a big curves through the city. It's not straight at all. Uh, and when it is spring and the, the snow in the mountains melts, great gusts of water, you can also get great rains. Of course, everything's changed now due to the climate being very different. But even in the mid 19th century, this was a river that flooded often, and it created a lot of problems for all of the residences and commercial areas along the river, which was why uh, this was a this is another example of how wide the river here is, uh, the sort of shallow embankments that led up to the city. But then, of course, on the, on the one hand, which is the current neighborhood of Prati or fields, you see that openness uh, on the left bank of what you're seeing in this particular image, which is yet another photograph of an unknown photographer uh, taking a perspective more similar, this would be just probably with the, st the specky stairs to the back of the person taking the photograph, uh, which is in the American Academy in Rome's photographic archive. And you can see fishermen, this is kind of a quaint scene showing the river at a moment of great calm. But as I'm suggesting, the river was very often not calm. Um, and so what happens then as Rome modernizes, and in particular, as more people moved to, to Rome now that it becomes a nation's capital uh, in 1870. The great siege at the um, Porta Pia seizes Rome as capital. Uh, and then very quickly, there are the need for ministry buildings, government buildings. I myself am from Washington, DC. It's a government town. There are probably you know whatever percentage of the city is built to serve as a government capital. Uh, or as a national capital. And of course, the case was true also in Rome. It needed all these new buildings. It needed all of these new roads. Um, and of course, it had new roads that were long and straight in the kind of Haussmann model from Paris that just cut right through urban fabric. And then the other great challenge was this river that kept flooding the, the nation's capital, which was problematic. And so there was a major push of starting in 1883, the construction begins for a road called the Lungo Tevere, which are major embankments that then hem in the river uh, and create these massive walls with boardwalks right along the river. And all of that area I've just shown you was obliterated, raised. There were no protection laws at the time that Alessandro Specchi staircase uh, was destroyed. And you see here a photograph taken of the area during the fascist period around roughly uh, 1930, probably in the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, and you can see the kind of buildup. This is, there's now created this little, well, it's now a very highly trafficked area, but even by this time, you, the focus is now inward. That beautiful port along the river, you can't even see the river from that edge of the town now because it's been so raised up uh, from the river level. Uh, so what I want to suggest is that even in an exhibition like In Light of Rome, where these spectacularly detailed, highly moving images of a Rome that no longer exists are presented in some ways for us to consider the art of photography and the role of photography in a capital city that has been an art capital uh, for centuries, if not millennia, these very same photographs, when considered in light of this short history of photographs that I'm showing you, um, they also become testaments to a modern history and the photographs themselves then shift to become documents of a, of a time and a space as it evolves and slowly then disappears. So they become chronicles of time, they become photojournalism in the sense of re uh, recounting um, a modern history within a short period of time, and they also become documents in the service of historic preservation because it was with the destruction of the destruction of that specky staircase that all kinds of preservation laws were within 10 to 15 years enacted that then subsequently protected so many elements of what was called minor architecture you know that specky staircase was not the Colosseum, but it was nonetheless something that had distinguished that landscape for 200 years uh, and without protection laws as the lungo tevere suggests uh, it was at great risk of disappearing virtually overnight. And in fact, now it's gone. 
This was also the case of a second site along the river uh, that photographers were drawn to with a similar kind of attention. Um, here you see a photograph from the exhibition, Robert McPherson's Palazzo Alto Viti on the Tiber River. And I think one of the things, this is, an ex, this is a photograph taken around 1850s, um, an albumin print from a glass negative. So again, a highly detailed, probably a large eight by 10 glass negative, uh, given how large the camera was that Robert McPherson was using. This is a Scottish photographer who's worked in Rome and documented its build in and around Rome. He traveled through Tivoli and other places nearby, uh, usually focusing his lens on ancient monuments. But here, I think one of the things that drew so many photographers to this building is the way that it just rises from the river. It has a Venetian quality to it in that regard that there's no transition between, there's no landscape uh, or, or flat ground between the building and the river. It just sits there as if it were floating. And this from a photographic perspective has a certain um, draw, a visual appeal, um, an uncanny quality to it that we don't often expect buildings to just sit right on top of the river. We expect some sort of transition space. Uh, and so already by the 1850s, this was a site that drew several photographers. I'm showing here another work a representation of virtually the same scene, although zoomed out a little bit, by Romualdo Moscioni, who was a photographer operative in Rome a little bit later. This is taken in the 1880s. Um, Moscioni was best known as a photographer of the of the Vatican collections. So the Vatican museums that we can go and see today, Moscioni was one of the first photographers to document every aspect of its collection. Um, and at the Academy, we have a holding of his photographs of the Vatican's Etruscan um, holdings. Uh, but he also photographed areas of architecture and like the Palazzo Alto Viti uh, in the 1880s. And then we also, I found in the American Academy in Rome, a photograph taken before 1888 of the same building, but from a 90 degree angle. So what you can imagine is the river on the right-hand side of this building just below. Um, this is a phot photograph that was taken from its side so that you can see the depth of the building, let's say, as it leads into that city block. And you're seeing the photograph in a somewhat of a moire screen, those dots, because similar to the Lecky photographs, um, those were reproduced through lithographs. Here, the photograph was just reproduced directly in the newspaper. And that's the kind of pixelating that you're seeing already in the late 19th century. Um, but this is a building, again, I want to show one additional view. Again, you're thinking, I've just seen three photographs, they look virtually the same. Um, but what's moving forward in time is the date at which these photographers are documenting this site and also the urgency with which they are representing it. Because by this time, by the 1870s, 1880s, when uh, Paolo Francesco d'Alessandri, Moscioni, when these later photographers are documenting this building, they are aware that the Lungo Tevere, the same road to build up the Tiber embankments, is going to replace this building. And like the Specchi staircase, this whole swath of urban landscape was demolished to make room for that road. And in fact, this particular photograph of the Palazzo Alto Viti, taken in 1878, was reproduced in a volume called Il Tevere Stato Anterio, the state of the, te of the Tiber River before uh, the construction work began. And so the, by, 18, by the mid 1880s, this was one of the first sites that was completely raised to make room for this new road. Um, and I'm focusing on this so closely because these are two of the sites in which when seen in the exhibition, in, re reproduced in the 1850s in these richly detailed, poignant photographs from the 1850s, you don't necessarily know, those photographers didn't necessarily know what was on the horizon for these particular sites. But those very same sites, which drew photographers and artists before them because of their spectacular visual qualities and centrality to the urban fabric of Rome, were unfortunately the very same qualities that made them attractive, that centrality um, and that picturesque relationship to the river, the very same qualities that put them at risk once the city needed to modernize to make room for all of this population booming uh, and needing to be a more functional fluid city as increasing traffic made it necessary to have um, not only a greater road system, but also to avoid this constant flooding. Um, and I think, if we think about how does art history, how can we learn from art history to reflect upon our contemporary situation? 
Of course, flooding is a situation that we now have to deal with much more frequently and with much greater um, hyperbolic results if you think about um, something like Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Sandy and the way that the whole southern part of Manhattan, its embankments are at risk uh, in a way that scaled back, of course, the Tiber embankments were at risk for the city of Rome. So there are ways in which these photographs encourage us not only to think about art history, not only to think about photography as a medium or Rome as a city and its urban development, but also about climate change. If you start to think closely about the history of these images, where they were going in the next few years. Um, and this, um, that same book by the Fratelli d'Alessandri, the Ripetta staircase was also reproduced in that volume. So by the 1870s, 1880s, the photographers are very aware that whereas these are pictures we may encounter today and think, oh, what a beautiful site, why they're recording this particular site is because they are aware that without that photographic image, we will no longer have access to it. And in fact, the site is gone. And today we sit and enjoy the beautiful images that end up at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. Um, and so with that, I. I want to close with one final thought, returning to this Matania image. And one of the things that is very much not present in the photographs that I've shown and in many of the photographs in the exhibition, although there are some portraits and genre scenes, uh, are people. As I suggested in the beginning, early photography and its um, technological requirements were such that things had to be very still. And so recording people and certainly battle scenes was impossible. It just would all come out as a big blur. Um, but I think one of the key things, and, and uh, Frank points to this in his essay, one of the th key things to remember or to ask ourselves today is that, well, if they did represent um, the populations in Rome, and if the photojournalistic sensibility of trying to shape ideas and, sh and uh, catalyze action were applied to the population, what are some of the issues that would be at stake? Um, and this speaks then, of course, to the ideas of nationhood and who has access to those national ideals of liberty and freedom. Um, to, to whom do those ideals apply? And Rome at the time was a place where surrounding the entire capital city, the Roman countryside was under the control of this system of what are called lat latifundi. Um, this was a kind of like a feudal estate management situation whereby landlords owned these massive landscapes with a villa or a tenuta in the center and then all of the workers lived on the land and in exchange for their working the land and reaping the various crops um, these were often migrant laborers who lived on the on the properties at the right seasons they were entitled to keep some of it but they had to give half of it or a third of it uh, or keep a third of it but the other of it had to go to the owner so there it very much beholden to the owner for their entire livelihood. Uh, and these people would come into Rome to sell the small portion of whatever it is they had harvested to the community as a way to survive. Um, and by the 19 teens, books and photographic reportages in magazines or, or let's say newspapers, sorry, not so much magazines, newspapers were being published or photographs were being reproduced to call attention to this essential sort of persistence of serfdom in the modern era and how um, unmodern and unnational, unpatriotic this system was. Um, so I just wanted to hint towards the kinds of issues that photography will soon after the period of focus in this exhibition be able to address and the kinds of directions into which questions of nationalism uh, are pushed in part through photography. Um, so with that, I, I wanted to close my remarks, again, thanking everybody very much for the invitation to share my work a little bit in light of this exhibition, in light of Rome, which, again, if anybody out there listening is remotely near Maine, I hope you're able to go and see. Thank you very much. Well, what a terrific um, talk. Lindsay, thank you so very, very much. Um, we so appreciate um, your reflections on the photography uh, of this period. We have about 10 minutes for uh, questions and answers, and already a couple of questions have come into the 
um, have, have come in, but I welcome others uh, who um, have questions uh, to please put, type them into the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many uh, as possible. Lindsay, maybe I'll start with the first question. And, you know, of course, photography, um, you know, is introduced to the world in, in 1839. And so the period that we're looking at, this is a, a very new visual technology. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about or do, whether you have a sense of sort of the popular conversation uh, among about photography among Romans um, of this period. Did they embrace it? Was it ever a source of controversy? What did the papacy think of this new technology? Um, do you get a sense of, again, the, the response by those who were encountering uh, these kinds of images during this period? That's a wonderful question. Um, of course, one of the things to think about is, well, how would one answer that question? And yeah. the, the, the best, source really would be commentary. I mean, the way people wrote about, well, three places, the way people wrote about these things in, in books, things like Jesse White Mario's book, where they make, they comment on the proliferation of photographs. This is increasingly true. Well, it's really true from the moment the, the medium is announced, um, because as you're suggesting, it's um, you, it quickly becomes ubiquitous, although, as I tried to suggest, that happens in part through reproductions. Um, so they're not exactly sure what they're looking at. They're aware that there's this thing called a photograph, which is a direct representation of the visual world. But then oftentimes when they're encountering that in a popular way, it's through a print based on that image. And so that there's a level of remove there. And they don't often talk about that. They don't talk about that. That's something that scholars more lately, uh, uh, more recently have discussed. Um, but certainly it was fascinating. And it was something that was a hobby that people tried to pick up as quickly as possible. Uh, of course, initially it was expensive and equipment was prohibitive and it was circulated amongst an elite, to be sure. I mean, you have certainly within an aristocratic uh, group in Rome, Conte Giuseppe Primoli, perhaps being the best known um, photographer count, descendant of Napoleon, um, who was a pioneer really of handheld photography by the 1880s. He frequented a circle of people who were excited about photography. These would have been archeologists were among the firsts in Rome, certainly to pick up the medium and use it in the spirit or to advance their studies of antiquity. Um, and of course there were studios. There were so many studios in Rome, most of them serve, uh, serving the tourist market. And of course, tourists write in their memoirs or in their books or in their letters to people about the wonderful photographs that they're collecting of images and sites in Rome. That's a major driver of photographic media uh, prints in Rome, in Florence, in Naples, in Venice, in the very same cities that we tend to visit today. I mean, the grand tour once photography emerges is a great subject uh, for photographers at that time. And of course, there are carte de visites and people want to make images of themselves and the same impulse that drives us to make selfies of each other or take photographs of our friends and family when we're traveling. People had the same impulse. Of course, everything is slower and there's less of it, but the impulses are the same. So I think there was great euphoria. Uh, was there also wariness? Certainly, I mean, this is also a city that has been the source, a real source of artistic tradition the, and, and the study I mean, the, the Beaux-Arts tradition begins in Rome with the French pensionnaires coming here to study uh, already in the 17th century. And so there was great debate on the degree to which photography was in the service of the arts. Was it a challenge to the arts? I mean, the same debates that um, surfaced in, in France and in England are happening here. I think the difference is that all of those academies dedicated to the study of art and architecture are in Rome. And so you have the very people who are supposed to be doing the technical drawings and the measuring without photography, all of a sudden they have photography at their fingertips and is that a good thing or not? Um, and you have a nation that is much younger than France or England at the time. And so they're very, there's very little national support or national photographic circles. You have a lot of regional photographic circles or even civic photographic circles. Um, and so one of the things that's so challenging about even studying this material is that, for example, all of the Roman situation that I've described today, or that's the focus of this exhibition, is virtually unknown and untraceable if you go to Milan 
or if you go to Florence, or if you go to, you know, Sicily, they have completely different photographic histories in their archives and in their museums. Um, whereas I think it's more centralized in the French context or the, or the British context. Lindsay, that's wonderful. Let's get to some of the uh, audience questions. Uh, Professor Susan Wegner uh, in the art history department here at Bowdoin uh, writes, um, do you know of any photographs recording the vanishing pa paintings on the palace facades uh, painted by Caravaggio in the 16th century? Um, really interested uh, to whether there is any kind of um, photographic documentation of those earlier artistic traditions. That's a wonderful question, and the answer is absolutely. I can't speak to the Caravaggio specifically, but I know that there were huge campaigns. The John Henry Parker collection, for example, which is a photographer who enlisted, a British photographer um, who came to Rome. He was the keeper of antiquities at the Ashmolean Museum at, at Oxford, and he came to Rome or was already here because of ill health, but he enlisted the support of seven to eight Italian photographers to go and document, in part, precisely the kinds of um, paintings and frescoes and decorative elements on the outsides of buildings that you're describing. Um, in part, this was motivated by a desire to document, let's say, Christian, Christian archaeology or um, the Vatican for, certainly is hiring people like Moshoni to document these various painting cycles. Um, but then you have more secularly driven campaigns uh, which absolutely are trying to document anything under the sun. Um, I mean, everybody is aware that Rome is in this massive state of transformation. And usually what you find are there are these photographic campaigns that are motivated by archaeology or motivated by usually archaeology or um, museum collections. And then among those archives or within those collections, there are smaller campaigns to document precisely the kinds of um, frescoes. For example, Moshoni does a whole series dedicated to the painting cycles at Tarquinia of Etruscan tomb walls. Um, so yes, there's definitely that kind of image, imagery there. That's wonderful. Um, she follows up, uh, Susan does, with a, a question about uh, whether these early landscape photographers um, working in Rome were emulating any of the vedute painters, uh, printmakers uh, of an earlier uh, period. It, what's the kind of conversation between an older uh, painting tradition and a new photographic tradition of picturing the urban landscape? There's a very close conversation. In fact, the early photographers have a hard time shaking that history. Um, they're very keen to reproduce it almost verbatim, if you want to think about it that way in visual terms. Um, so images of the Colosseum, for example, uh, after Valadier's restoration with that great diagonal cut on one side, just as painters focus on that detail, so do photographers. Um, or that view from within the Colosseum, that romantic, I mean, the, the, the concept of romanticism and that Roman nostalgia and fixating on ruins is, of course, born in Rome for a reason. And the painters who would find themselves inside the Colosseum painting from outside the arch or the Piranesi prints with the plant life, the wild capers dripping, um, the photographers reproduce the exact same perspectives. Um, McPherson's view of the ancient monument there at Tivoli on the outcropping there by the waterfall um, it reproduces exactly what a whole host of painters had reproduced for generations before that. Uh, in part, this is commercially driven. The people who are tourists coming to Rome like to purchase the same views that they were accustomed to print, uh, purchasing as prints. And then there is the, um, the great nostalgia, as I was suggesting. It's a moment where, where Rome is modernizing very quickly, uh, and there is great debate about what's going to become of these ancient monuments? How are they going to be framed? How are they going to be viewed? Of course, as we come to St. Peter's Square today, it's all open around that. But up until the 19th century, that was very dense urban housing uh, that lasted through the mid 19th century. And then it was obliterated around the tomb of Hadrian right there at um, Oh, Piazza Augusto Imperatore, right there in front of what is now the Arapaches. That entire urban block went through complete transformation. It used to all just be housing. And now there's 
a um, mausoleum in the middle it's become a museum and there's a road and there's another museum it's completely different um, and it took photographers a while to shake the legacy of the veduta tradition for sure you're getting lots of compliments in the question and answer uh oh, thank lots you. of thanks uh <laughs> One final question from John McGuigan himself, oh, who yes. says, hi, Lindsay, I'd love to hear about the trajectory of your feelings about the dramatic urban transformation of Rome as your study, research, and writing has unfolded. We all love Rome today, but there is a certain sadness when through the study of early photography, we learn how many treasures were lost. I'm thinking specifically of Debonis' reactions to the vandals of Rome. Mm -hmm. That's a great... That's a great question. Um, I love that he asks about feelings in part because Rome is a city that does evoke so many feelings. I mean, people get emotional here. It's a kind of an emotional place um, <laughs> because there is so much ruin and there is so much loss and there are so many traces of that. But at the same time, now keep in mind, I'm an optimist. That's just how I come into the world. <laughs> However, I find the longevity of that process of change. I mean, Rome has been a center of modernity since the, the Romulus and Remus on the Palatine. <laughs> it's a city of constant change. So there's comfort in that, I think, because what you see in Rome are traces from every historical era of the population having to grapple with its values. What are we gonna preserve? Where are we gonna construct new urban fabric? Why? what's going to get destroyed in the process. And so when we see in this photographic era, the disappearance of the Specchi stairs or the disappearance of the Palazzo Alto Viti, uh, at the same time, we've made space for a new museum by Zaha Hadid, which houses the Maxi Museum of Architecture and Art of the 21st Century. Or we see a new theater by Renzo Piano just opposite there. And of course, these things aren't in the city center. You have the interjection of a building by Richard Meyer, which was a complete uproar. People were very upset about the presence of something so new in the historic city center. But people have always been in an uproar about change. Nobody likes change. Uh, but Rome is the city that lets us know that change is inevitable. And, you know, those Stecky, Stecky stairs were there for 200 years. They weren't there before that. People survived. Um, there's something kind of heartening uh, about a city where things are constantly a little bit in a state of chaos. <laughs> nothing's ever perfect and that's kind of okay <laughs> Lindsay this has been absolutely wonderful uh I want to thank you again for tuning in uh through the uh magic of zoom uh we were able to have you here uh, with us today and thank you so much for your presentation your your thoughtful responses to these questions and we wish you all the best in your final uh, months uh, at the American Academy before your move back to the United States and look forward to seeing you back in Brunswick, uh, hopefully sometime soon. But on thank behalf you. of everybody here at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, thank you and thank you to our good audience uh, who have been here this afternoon and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say one final thing. It, if it weren't for my art history studies at Bowdoin College and my study of Italian at Bowdoin College, none of anything that I said today would ever have come to my mind. So thanks to, to everybody here who recognizes the wonderful benefits of a Bowdoin College education. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. All right. Have a great afternoon. Ciao. You too. Bye bye.